Hello, and welcome to another episode of Within the Game podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Wexler, and this episode is one of my favorites. I'm talking to my guy, Chris Geeter McGee. His ability to see greatness in others and to just always be in the stay ready mode is what makes him one of my most inspired role models. He was the longtime voice of the AVP, the Pro Beach Volleyball Tour, and he's the current host of The Lake Show on Spectrum Sports Network, where they talk everything Lakers. I hope you enjoy this episode and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks. All right, I'm here with Chris McGee, the one and only Geeter. Geeter, thank you so much for being here, man. Aaron, it's a pleasure, man. We go way back. We go way back, man. Oh, uh, man, your, your bio is amazing. You played volleyball at Cal State Northridge. You worked as yeah. an athletic director at Wildwood uh, in Los Angeles. Oh, you're Angeles. going deep. You're finding some deep stuff, huh, buddy? You're an amazing coach at Sports Shack, a longtime announcer and voice of the AVP. You're part of the Oakley team, Team Fletch, yeah. four-time mm-hmm. champs at the Manhattan Beach Six Men. And now you're, you're living your dream job of lead studio yeah. anchor for the Lakers on Spectrum Sportsnet. You're a father, husband, and legend in the South Bay, Chris mm-hmm. McGee, Dieter. Hey, man. Good job, buddy. That's, that's <laughs> one of the best ones. You know, I usually don't get intros, man, so it's kind of nice to nice to uh, since I made a career basically off of giving other people intros. It's nice yeah. to uh, nice to get one, you know? Cool, man. Cool, cool. Uh, your IG and Twitter is at Geeter3. And yep, yep. Uh, I'm just super stoked that you're here with us today. Thank you so much. I'm going to jump right into the first question for you, man. What is Do living? It, what does living an inspired life mean to you? I think it's, I think for me, living an inspired life is, uh, you know, especially during these times when you and I are talking, we're in the middle of COVID-19 and quarantine and, uh, I think a lot of people have had time to reflect, whether it's in sports and business and life, family, um, how to get through times like these. And even, listen, I'll I'll be straight with you. I I almost felt selfish during this time because like things, I still have a job. Um, My girls are good. Uh, Family's getting through it. Uh, We have a bunch of silver linings, how we're, you know, getting closer at times like these. But there are days that you have to find inspiration and there are days that you have to get out of bed and fight it, depression, fight um, this time. And, and, and it made me realize that, man, people go through this when things are going well in the world in my life and I don't even know what's going on and there's no COVID-19. People battle real things. People need inspiration. So to answer your question, living an inspired life for me is like having a reason to get up and do it, you know, having a reason to get after the grind, whatever you love to do, uh, getting after it, you know, what inspires you and how do you inspire others? Um, I I've never, I've always been told like, Oh, Gator, you give inspirational speeches. And my buddy Jared at Texas has me talk to his team all the time. And he says it's so inspirational. And when I coached, it was always, you know, giving the fire up speeches. And, and I don't see myself as like an inspirational person, but I, but I do realize that by your actions and the way you get after it, you can inspire people. Um, you, you and I have known each other a, a long time and you knew me before I was doing Laker stuff. And, um, you know, I feel like an inspired life is, you know, figuring out what you love, figuring out your dreams, and dude, just go get it and get it the right way by putting yourself in the right spot, um, by manifesting, um, and by not being afraid to get knocked down and get up again, man. So Love that. for me, that's, that embodies an inspired life, inspiring yourself and inspiring others to, to, to do it right. I love that, Geeter. You know, the word that comes to my mind when I think about you and your career and what you stand for is passion. You know, I have this distinct memory of you coaching at Sports Shack. And I, w- mm-hmm. I, was, I was young back then, but I was an inspired uh I was an aspiring coach and I was watching you coach and you would just pace up and down the sidelines and, you know, just be like so into every single point and just so into it. And that passion was just exuding from you, you know? And it's, 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 it's funny you say that Aaron, because you know, now when I coach my daughter's 12s team, I'm back coaching. And it's funny, like people that have known me forever will laugh and their, their kids, are now playing and they're there and they're at American Sports Center and they're like videoing me and sending it to me and they're like, dude, we just love watching you on the sideline. 
and I always find it funny. It's just how I've always been. I don't know, like, listen, there are days where you sit and you're mellow and you're letting a team get through some things, but I've just always felt when my teams are playing their best, I'm usually up and I'm with them. You know, does that, does that make sense? So Absolutely. I just, I don't know. I, man, I, it was like, dude, when I got into girls club volleyball, I was 22 years old. I was at Northridge and Jared Elliott and Tim Jensen were owning West side, which became sports Shack. And they're like, dude, we need you to help coach this 17th team. And my career had just ended. And, you know, every summer I would help my old high school Crespi. I would coach club, you know, but this was like my first, like, okay, I'm going to do this. And that's what it was when you were coaching club. It was like, let's go. You're on the sideline. And, and it just stuck. And here I am 26 years later <laughs> and it's still, still doing it. So, so I appreciate it. When you were saying about the one word that comes to your mind for my career, I was thinking luck, uh, but passion <laughs> is much better, man. Passion is, uh, I appreciate that. I think that's one of the best compliments you can give. And, and I appreciate, appreciate you saying that, you know, I appreciate, uh, those people that, that, that feel that it's funny, man. I, it's, you know, like you and I were talking today, we were supposed to talk the other day. It's just funny how things happen. Um, this is so random. And I only coached this, this young woman one year, a girl named Carrie Hance, Marymount kid played for our club stud. And it was, we won a national title in 2005 and it was a big deal. We had had a lot of close calls and almost wins and to finally do it in 05 with this special team. And she was a stud and she was all a barrel and she ended up going to play in Michigan for four years. And I'll see her and her family from time to time, beach club stuff on the 4th of July. I've seen them. And, you know, you don't, they, they were just wonderful people, wonderful people. And you're only with them a year, but they were in our club a, a few years, but with my team for one year. And the mom sent me something today, her mom, Ann, out of nowhere, Aaron, out of nowhere. And it was on Instagram and she'd seen a picture of my daughters or something. And she was like, love seeing your beautiful family uh geeter uh here's my girl that you helped shape and it was an unbelievable article from an ann arbor michigan newspaper about carrie who's now a nurse dude and is on the front line wow. dealing with this every day i got goosebumps thinking about it and I, I showed it to my wife jess and i'm like i never thought of like being a part of carrie's life like that and shaping but i you know tim and i were instrumental for that time and her coach carrie klein was as well and people that were a part of her, but like it just means so much for a parent to come out and say that to you so I don't take for granted you know I was with Landon uh uh Landon has a uh, I don't you know Landon out here in Hermosa yeah, yeah. Deep, deep. yeah I did Instagram live it was so yep. fun I saw it it was hilarious yeah, it was cool dude <laughs> but it was funny he asked me about Kobe and like do guys like Kobe do they understand the reach they have and what their meaning is to people and fans and I like it's funny, you, me, you run a club, you coach kids, like you're an inspirational guy. Like you don't, we don't even realize the reach we have and the people we've, I mean, I feel so good when kids that I've coached reach back out and show me their families or like tell stories of stuff that I said. I'm like, oh my God, I said that, you know, but like we, it, so it just meant a lot, man. It really, you know, you, you talk about passion, you talk about inspiration and those are pillars to success, man. Those are keys to life whether it's in sport, whether it's in business, whether it's in family. And I don't know what it is, Aaron, but it felt good to get that today. Yeah, it felt amazing. good to get that note from her today. It just did, you know? It, um, that's amazing. It, it gave, yeah. me, gave me goosebumps, man. I yeah. mean, you know, I, I, I want to I ask you about this because you have this, you've always had this, you've had this innate ability to – observe greatness in others mm -hmm. yeah for sure ever since i've met you i mean as a coach as an announcer now as a, uh, a broadcaster on, on spectrum i mean you, you you continue to have that i mean i want to ask you about practice you can answer this as a mm -hmm. player back when you were playing or as a coach mm -hmm. or any of the any of the hats that you wear um what does having an inspired practice mean to you oh that's good <sighs> You know, an inspired practice to me, it's interesting when you said it, I tried to think back to playing days more than coaching. Mm -hmm. And I feel like for me, and I don't know when this started, I wish I had the answer, but immediately my mind goes to 
those practices with your squad, with your boys, when you just had the, a war or just an epic practice, there's a feeling you have and it's hard to explain. It's hard to teach. It's hard to coach because it happens organically and it's about the group more than anything. And you know, it as a coach, you know, when you walk away and you go, God, man, damn, that was a good practice. That's an inspired practice. When you walk away feeling that we got better, we accomplished something, we as a team, like a group of people, a group of women, a group of men, a group of girls, a group of boys, like, man, we, we, we actually saw like the fruits of our labor. We saw the work pay off in an amount of time in a small window. That's an inspired practice to me. Like when you walk out of there and you're dead ass tired mm -hmm. and you're sweaty and you feel good, man, you feel rejuvenated. You feel like you can go run another 10 miles. You feel like you can conquer anything. And there's this, um, I feel like there's this confidence that people need in life, self-confidence. It's not a cockiness, it's confidence. And I feel like that comes from moments like that where you feel like you're a part of something and it helps you in, in other areas. That's awesome, man. Um, carry that over to an uninspired practice. What is that? Mm. Like? Yeah, man. Uh, an another great question by you dragging dude. Like right. when you walk out of somewhere, just not motivated. Um, when you have a hard time going and don't even want to be there, when you just can't seem to get it right, I'll use volleyball, and just not handling the ball well, setting terrible, hitting balls out, and then more of how your body language is and your attitude and the team stinking and just an unmotivated practice where you just feel whether it's dissension among the team or selfishness among the team to me that's an uninspired practice and so to me that and i'm not saying you don't need to have those but right. that's uninspiring right yeah you know, if that makes sense yeah it does make sense and i feel like it happens more often than all of us want Dude. athletes and coaches so you know this project is all about the tools right what tools yeah can we implement in those moments you know it yeah. can you offer any tools that has that has have worked for you as a coach player yeah it's Man, that's such a good point. I, I, I feel like, you know, Aaron, every great team, think about all the teams you've had. Like, just because you always, just because you win it too, like you could have a great team that wins. That doesn't necessarily mean you didn't have an unbelievable journey. You know, like you could have teams that fall short, teams that get upset. Um, teams that have come so close and don't get there, but that journey is incredible. And I think that's the key to the whole thing because there are tools you can use when you have the uninspired practice. There are ways as coaches and mentors and leaders, we can help kids by, hey man, like there are days Aaron where you gotta feel it and you gotta go, you know what? I'm gonna make them get through this. And you're gonna grind them. And afterwards, you bring them in, and you tell them why and you tell them how you get through it and you stay together during these times and it's okay to be crappy today it's okay to have something else on your mind it's okay that you know what your boyfriend broke up with you and right now that's your world and volleyball didn't matter today like dude you're human that's okay to feel those things how can we our team help you. How can you rely? How can I rely on Aaron that he's going to know I need it that day and he'll carry me. He'll carry me. Like and that. there's days where, and there's days dude where, you know, they just don't have it and maybe you don't have it and you don't want to see them. And there's, it's okay to sometimes go, you know what? We don't need to be here today. Like there's so many tricks to the trade of, and I, and I think it comes from a feel and it comes from confidence in coaches to know that, you know what, man, this last hour ain't going to do anything for you. Send them home, send them home and let's, and let's talk about it next time. Or you know what? I'm going to grind them and get them through it. I'm going to stop in the middle of practice one time. I'm going to sit them down. And I'm going to go, I want you guys to go meet in that room and come back in 30 seconds. Tell me if you want to keep practicing or not. And if you want to keep practicing, let's do it. Let's do it for real. And more times than not, the beauty of an uninspired practice or a bad moment or getting kids through tough times or, learning what tools you have to 
you know, go down and back up is like getting through tough times, getting right. through adversity and making things really hard. Like, dude, you and I know, like when it's easy, man, it's easy. And, mm -hmm. and you're not, it, that doesn't necessarily mean you're awesome. It just means you're getting through it and you're not getting tested that much. I think the real battle in the real journey is getting tested and failing, getting knocked down and getting back up and creating those tools, verbal tools, um, you know, writing stuff down, talking it out, sometimes letting it go. I mean, I think there's so many tools that go into it, you know, and, and I think we have to teach kids that it's okay some days to wear your emotions on your sleeve if that's who you are and get after it. And there are days where maybe that emotional kid just wants to ball and be quiet because they got a lot on their plate. You know what? That's cool. And right. me as a coach, I got to know that that's cool. I can't be like, Aaron, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? I got to know my players. I got to know that Aaron's, you know what? Aaron's having one of those days. Just let him deliver. Let him play. Leave him alone, you know? Okay, so that's awesome. That's practice. Let's carry that over to game. game Games. Yeah. A lot tougher, right? A lot well, tougher. What does an inspired game mean to you? Yeah. funny you ask that question is it, it, I, it's, I, I always want to see where my mind goes immediately you know um, I think an inspired game well let me give you a couple different things sure. for me I think when, when you say inspired game the first thing I thought of Aaron for some reason was JO's okay I thought of like gnarly matches at JO's because I feel like I just know what it means to me <laughs> and I know that I live for them and I know that it makes all those hours away from my family when my kids were young and I was still coaching worth it. All the grind of the entire year built for one tournament that lasts four days and day three was everything death match into the gold bracket like one bad game and nine months out the window and those kids go off to college and you don't ever see them again sometimes. It's a weird game to play. So for me, inspired games, I think of like when you're on that journey, whether it's the culmination, whether it's the beginning, whether it's the middle, when you see as a team, you play at a high level, whether it's hoops, whether it's football, whether it's volley, when things you've worked on click and you're playing at a high level and there's an emotion to it and a feeling where, I don't know, I don't get it anywhere else. I don't get it in my job and I have a great job. <laughs> I mean, dude, let me tell you something. When that camera red light goes on and you're like, oh my God, I'm at Staples Center doing Kobe's last game. Dude, that's intense and there are nerves, but it ain't like, playing with your team it's not like being in a big game yourself being in a big inspired game yourself there's just a feeling you get in your core like you can't buy it you can't teach it you got it it's in you and you know doing it with your squad is just it's the best win or lose man and i think a real inspired game also i think of like where the other team is on the same page as you Mm. And you have these battles that you remember for the rest of your life. And I think you don't, we all don't get a lot of those. Those were always the special ones for me as well. An inspired game, when you really break it down, is reaching a goal with another group of people where you've put in real work, Aaron, like, like real work, where you've had to sacrifice, where you've had to skip that party, you've had to skip that function because I have to be there with my team. And then you play in a game that matters. Love that. When it matters, man, is it fun, dude? It is fun, man. Some of my greatest memories. I love that. And so building on that, how does an inspired practice carry over to an inspired game? Well, that's, that's a great point. You know, I think as coaches, what they're always trying to say, man, and, and I remembered as a player and, and, and you know this, the tough part is, dude, players realize it long after they leave you. <laughs> it's often when they go coach <laughs> or when they go to college, they come back and they go, damn, you were right. <laughs> you know, listen, man, there's a guy named Ed Merrick who was my varsity 
assistant coach and basketball at Crespi High School. And man, I ran into him recently. It's funny because I saw him randomly at a, I was leaving a dinner uh, on a random Thursday night, right before uh, COVID started to hit. And I ran into him. He's like, McGee? And I looked and it was Ed Merrick. And, you know, he was young back then when I was in high school. He's older than me, 10 years or whatever. And I'm like, coach. And it was funny. We were walking up the street and talking and my group had already left. I was going to catch up with him. And I told him, coach, you know how many times I've used what you told our team my senior year? He's like, what did I tell you? I'm like, well, we were struggling. It was right before league. And you took us up to the top of the bleachers at Crespi High School, right by the track. And you told us, he kind of, I mean, he might have used a few cuss words, but he, he basically told us like, guys, because he, you know, he wasn't the head coach, but he was the dude, man. He was like good looking guy. Like he went to Crespi, he was making money. And when he showed up, like he coached, but the head coach was the man. And he took us on his own without the head coach. And he was like, let me tell you something. This basketball season lasts seven more weeks. Seven more weeks if you're lucky. That means you do something in the playoffs. He goes, I'm telling you guys right now, trust me, it's going to end. And it ends like this. And you never play again. And he goes, what you put into this is what you're going to get out of it. And, dude, it just stuck with me. Like, I try to always tell teams, like, guys, this team right now, it's never going to be the same, right? So – what you put into it on the practice floor and what you dedicate yourself to, you know what you're doing when you're not with the team, all that carries over to games. So you need to have inspirational practices to be able to deliver in those games. You don't just show up to game time and deliver. Right. Kobe didn't just show up. MJ is refining out in the last dance. And I know guys who played with MJ, he didn't just show up. Those stories are legendary, but they're true. And Kobe was the same damn way. LeBron, the same damn way. Tom Brady's still doing it at 42 years old. He just doesn't show up. It's a life choice. Mm. Kerry Walsh Jennings, still doing it. Your buddy, you and I were talking off camera earlier about John Hyden. Dude, John Hyden and I played against each other in college. Dude, I'm 48 years old. John's just a little bit younger than me. John still sides out against the world. He's an anomaly, dude. But you think Johnny just wakes up and goes out and does it? Johnny grinds. He puts in work. Nutri nutrition, fitness, all the greats, dude. That's what they do. Yeah. That's what they do. And if you think you're going to have inspired games, because let's be honest, Aaron, inspired games are the fun part. Inspired game. There's nothing more fun in sports than an inspired game, a game with meaning, a game that matters. And you don't get it unless you put in the time and practice. It's truth. It's truth. I love it's it. Not cliche. I love it. I can't, I couldn't agree more. Let's talk about emotion. Yeah. What are the differences and similarities in emotion from both an inspired practice and an inspired game? Yeah, that's, that's good, man. Um, shoot. I wish I had the, you know, hopefully I'll learn when I read what you write about it, you know, for me, <laughs> like for me, I know, listen, I, 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 you know, I, all joking aside, like there's different emotions and people have different emotions. And I think what makes a leader, you know, whether you're the captain of the team, you know, or a coach or a parent, the emotions matter. And yeah. you have to understand emotions and you have to understand that some players are more emotional than others. You know, I have a kid who's a quiet player in a libero and all she's been told her whole life is that you got to be loud. You got to be loud. And I, I was one of the first people to ever tell her, I don't need you to be loud. I don't need you to be someone you're not. Now I need you to be vocal on the court when there's, when it matters, like calling a ball, but you don't need to be the one doing flips and screaming all the time. Like just be you and let's figure it out from there. And I think that kid appreciated it a little bit. Now, listen, you and I both know a lot of the great liberals we've seen, they are monsters uh, personality wise. That's what makes them great, but that's not everyone. Right. Right. There's a reason why small outside hitters, the great small outside hitters that you've known in your lifetime, there's a reason they were great. You know why? They were mother effers, dude. And they had attitudes and they flew around and they banged and they got roofed and they hit the ball 85 feet out of bounds, but they were coming at you a million miles an hour at all times. I was never going to rein in that emotion on those kids. I had great small outside hitters. I was fortunate enough to have great ones throughout the years. You know what? I let them go. 
I let him go through the ups and downs. And as time went on, I would learn how to bring him aside and say, Hey, maybe make an adjustment there. Maybe you don't go a million out million miles an hour there. Maybe you see that set's not great and you don't need to be that five, seven kid that's going to put the ball away when the set's off the net. How about you just go zone five, skim it off the top of the hands and let's see if we can keep that ball in play. Like you learn kids emotion. I might have a guy or a girl that dude, when they're fiery and they're rolling, man, you let it go because they can carry a team, but you see the dips and the dips is when you have to understand and be able to take them out, take them aside and explain to them that this roller coaster doesn't always work because we go down. So how do we get here? How do we stay steady? Uh, Aaron, another big thing of emotion is how are you steady, Freddie? And how do you pick up your emotion and your intensity late in the game? Mm. You know, coaches will say, listen, and I'm one of them. I want you focused at zero, zero. I want you focused at 10, 10. But do you, do you and I play this game? We both know dog. When it's 22, 22, it's on, right? It, it, it's 13, 13. It's fifth. It ain't zero, zero in the first. I, I don't care what you say as a coach. There's a different emotion and that's okay. How do you channel that? And how do you put that on your side? Right. Right. That's how right. do you let a, how does a bad call not crush you? Bad calls have crushed me. And many times, man, many times as a coach, as a player, I let it get to me. Um, so I've had to battle with that myself. And, you know, you know, I've also used the foul. I'll never forget Phil Jackson. I don't know if you remember the 2001 season is when the Lakers were rolling, dude, they were undefeated going into Philly, lost the one. Yeah. So they played the Spurs in the Western Conference finals. And absolutely blasted them but early in that series really 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 tight game game one and phil gets tossed in san antonio in the middle of the third he knew what he was doing he knew they needed something he knew he needed to berate that ref because the ref made a bad call and he's basically saying it's us versus the alamo dome it's us for sixty thousand and the refs I'm going to let my team know I got your back. I'm going to get my ass tossed. And he did. And the Lakers rolled from there. Like, that's just genius. There's just right. moments where you got to know my team is emotional. They're freaking out. I need to be steady, Freddie, and I need to call them a timeout. I need to be calm. That year before, I go to the Lakers a lot. You know that. Me and you both mm -hmm. huge fans for our whole lives. When you got Phil and the Lakers are down 15, and Shaq and Kobe have both talked about this so has g fish so has ori so has fox any guy that was on that 2000 team the team that started the dynasty they were down 15 at home in game seven they had never won the championship they were up 3-1 in the series and here they are not only now tied 3-3 in the series but down 15 at home and dude phil was as cool as anything and shaq has always talked about going into that fourth quarter Phil was so mellow and like, we got this. And he always says, when I saw the general in control, I knew we were okay. So that's, that. that's where young coaches, Aaron can get so much better. That's where players can get better. Like knowing and learning and failing and okay. That time it got me and I was not better for it. Okay, well, what do I do the next time I'm in that situation? You know, like I get through that moment and I come out the other side better. So I'm all about the emotions of the game. I'm a guy that's, yeah. I'm a better player when I'm emotional, Aaron. Like when I'm kind of quiet, it's almost like I'm not as confident. Still to this day when I play in four mans, I feel like when I'm fiery, I'm playing well. Right. <laughs> so my play dictates my fire. I've had to learn how, man, I got to, I got to have fire no matter what. But right. man, when you're making mistakes, you can lose that fire real quick. All of a sudden, you're not that cocky and confident when you're making right. mistakes, right? So how do you stay confident in yourself when you're making mistakes is the biggest thing for a young player yeah. in any sport. Right. And, right? and that's, that's what we're talking about, that emotional management. So yep. that leads to the next thing, which is how does that inspired feeling transcend one's sport or discipline and carry over to their personal life? Ooh, that's good. That's good. I was going to give an example too, real quick though, of Kobe. Okay, yeah. Game seven, 2010. The most nerve wracking game of all time. Game seven. He has never beaten the Celtics. He has to beat him for his legacy. 
and that was the ugliest game. And the reason why I know this is it's been on all the time during quarantine. They always replay that game seven. Mm-hmm. And nobody could – it was the ugliest game ever. Dude, Kobe couldn't hit a shot. <laughs> right. But he figured out a way to not let it dictate the outcome of that game and his performance. He stuck with it, and he got 18 boards and whatever, nine assists, whatever. You know, like he played defense. Like he, it had that moment where it was like, oh, my God, I'm having the worst shooting game ever on the biggest stage. Wait, what else can I do? Oh, I can get rebounds. I can play great defense. And you know what? At the end of the game, he ends up hitting two big shots. So, like, it's hard, but in volleyball, it's like, hey, man, if you're hitting balls out all the time, there's so much more you can do. You can pass. You can cover. You can stuff a ball. Find a way to impact this game. That's not selfish. Me, me, me. I didn't put a ball away. I didn't do this. It's not about you. Teaching a kid that it's not about you. I love that. You know what I mean? There's yep. something else you can do to impact this game that will get you back on track. So, you know, how does that transcend into real life? Yeah. Like, dude, I mean, honestly, man, like, just look at what we're going through right now as a nation, as a, as a world. Like, right. things aren't always going to go your way. Sometimes, man, things are going to be out of your control. Um, you know, you can lose a job. Right. You know, I've been real lucky with jobs, but I remember when the AVP went bankrupt in 2009 and I thought my world was, wow, man, like, oh my God, you know, 2010, whatever it was like, yeah. wait, this is my bread and butter. I've put this ahead of everything and it, it rattled me to my core, but it also forced me to get after it more and go, Hey, I got a family. I have a kid. Yeah, Millie was two at the time. There I am without a job. And man, I got on the phone, I got on the emails and I took every job you could think of, Aaron. I was going to Texas to watch, to do that game. I'd fly to Florida to do that. I was doing every high school buck, everything. I was with Fox, ESPN. I would email every contact I had, give me whatever game you, and got back in it. And two years later, I'm in a position to get the Laker job. Like it was, you know, like you, how you handle the bumps and bruises in life and the knockdowns are really what's going to make you, you know? So you know, I, I think your question was like, how do you deal with the emotional component? How does it transcend to your real life? Is that what it was? Is that what yeah, how does it going? Transcend, you know, and how does it carry over to your personal or daily life? You know? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like, you know, I've had to learn a lot as a dad, like competitive, emotional. Is that always best for a little kid to see? Right. I've had, I've had to work on that. Right. You know, my I, coaching my own kid, boy, that's a lot different, bud, than coaching someone else's kid. I didn't know it. Um, you know, your kid looks at you as like, you're the dad, you're my dad, you're my dad. And all of a sudden now you're coach and they see your body language. They see you get pissed when they miss a serve. Because I'll tell you what, Aaron, man, when your kid misses a serve, it's a lot different than someone else's kid misses a serve. It's a bull. So like I've had to work so much on how that carries over to my real life. And, you know, being disappointed at work or something not going my way at work. How do I control those emotions? How do I, I'm having a bad day. You know, my job happens to be uh, on TV. So like if I'm having a bad day or I'm having a bad show, man, people can hear it in your voice. People can see it. Uh, It's on Twitter for people to tell you, you suck. It's a gnarly thing I've had to learn. Like, Oh my God, that person hates me. I thought I was liked by a lot of people. Like you suck at your job. You're the, you know, people getting on you. Like, man, there's a lot of roller coaster emotions I've had to go through and learn how to, you know, uh, whether it's meditation, whether it's keeping things in perspective, whether it's knowing what the ultimate, what are your priorities? Your priorities are your family, whatever it all, whatever they are, that's what's important. So you have to let that other stuff go. Karch Karai always taught me water off a duck's back. And he said that to me because he and I were doing a radio show back together back in 2003 and something pissed me off. And Karch looked at me and he goes, water off a duck's back, Eater. I was like, water off a duck's back? He's like, let it just go. I'm like, Karchi, like who better than Karchi? Of course, water off a duck's back. So I've always used that too, man. Whenever I'm really feeling like something's got me down and my emotions are getting the best of me, you know, learning how to take a deep breath, uh, uh, man, listen, man, some people got to go in a room and hit a pillow a few times, whatever you got to do to deal, whatever coping mechanism you have, 
to get you back where you're in your right mind and you can focus again. It's all about refocus for me, Aaron. Like, uh, you know, listen, I can't be an idiot here. I can't say something and risk my job because you know what? I have a family. So right. relax, take a breath. Who cares what that person's saying? What are the goals? What's your job? Boom, get back to it. That's a perfect segue to mindset. Let's talk about mindset. Mm-hmm. And specifically, yeah. we want to talk about mindset for your broadcasting career because mm-hmm. you're always on, Peter. I've never seen you. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I, I mean, yeah. not, like even um, announcing for the AVP, like you're on, you've got the mic, you can't make a mistake, you're on. Yeah. You know? And then, like you said, when that red light is on, you're on. So, can you just talk a little bit about like pre, during? Yeah. Dude, Aaron, it's, it's, it's interesting you, you, you brought that up and, and I don't think I've ever shared this with, with anybody too, but, or, or maybe a couple people here and there, you know, it's something my wife once said where during those days, and you got to think about from 98 to 2009. And then, you know, even when the tour went under, it came back and I was doing that event for Leonard for four years. So I was about 15, 16 years doing events and, and the toll mentally it would take afterwards where, as you said, Peter, you're always on. Well, I, in my mind and my mindset, I have to be on. I have to deliver because that's what you expect. That's what the fans expect. That's what the players expect. That's what my boss expects. I don't know any other way that being on takes a mental toll and a physical toll. So, she would always say like, well, you don't see him on Sunday night or Mondays. Uh-huh. And she would like, I was, I'm kind of a mess, right? Like headaches, no voice, tired, not want to see anybody. You know what I mean? Like there's a real, and it made me think of like, wow, players I've known that have struggled after sports um, with some stuff because you're just on and your people see you as something and you thrive. And then all of a sudden that's gone wow, how do I mentally get back to where I feel good? Right. What's my mental state? So, you know, I remember watching a a thing on Robin Williams, man, and you would see Robin Williams was on like Donkey Kong all hours of the day, but boy, did he battle afterwards with that and depression. And for me, that didn't answer your question, but that just got me thinking the whole mental part of things and being on, you kind of got me thinking that way. But for me, like, How do I get into a good mental place to do my job is what you were kind of saying, right? Like, well, it's a great question. Um, I feel like to do my job, I always had to, I always really struggled when, if you were just, when you woke up, there's just days where you don't feel right and you're a little cranky. And you don't feel in, in it. That does not go hand in hand with any job I've ever had. It doesn't work. I don't get to go sit in a cubicle and have no one know. Everyone's going to know. So I had to learn how to mentally get ready. And the way I did it, Aaron, was how I would prepare to play. Whether it was certain music, whether it was a moment to yourself when you're stretching, um, watching other people that I had played with throughout the years. Eric Sullivan and I played against each other our whole careers. And then after college, we played on the team Paul Mitchell together. We went over to Columbia together as a Team USA thing. And I saw him dial in for games. And that's how, you know, I learned from all kinds of different people. Matt Unger, who was a guy I played with, taught me so much um, how to deal with other players and how to deal with yourself, being a setter. Like, so I, I do, that's what I do for my own job. Like, I have to have a routine. Hey there, sorry for the interruption, but I wanted to give our first sponsor a shout out. This episode is brought to you by West Coast Beach, a year-round beach volleyball club on the west side of Los Angeles in Santa Monica, California. At West Coast Beach, we aim to get 1% better every day, both on and off the court. You can find more info about us at westcoastvbc.com and on Instagram with handle at westcoastvbc. Back to the show. I have a routine in my job now that makes no sense to people, Aaron. I it was a glimpse. What's the routine? Okay, so there's a th- this is so boring for people, but you'll like it. So we do our show. Say it's a pregame night, game night. I have to get there 
three hours before. It used to be more, but now it's about three and a half hours before. I want to get there early or than that. Because I want to set up, I want to walk around, I want to heckle some people, I walk through the newsroom, I check in, it's, 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 I don't know, it's a thing that I just, a little social, walk across, say hi to the bug, I get a little thing, something to drink, say hi to everyone, BS, get into my seat. Now when I'm in my seat, I'm ready. Look at the rundown, see what the producer already has in there. I've already shot him ideas, he shot me ideas, I look. I like to go through it a couple times, see where he's going. I'll give you an example. My boy B. Moore, Brandon Moore, he's one of our main producers. He sits like, I would say 20 yards away, two rows down, a little bit back. But he know when he's producing the show, when I yell, so on Twitter and Instagram, he's B. Moore Report. I'll go, B. Moore Report. And he knows like, all right, Geeter's ready to go. <laughs> and he's like, looks at me, he's got his phone. He's like working away. And he's like, he's probably thinking, Yo, dog, I've been here four more hours than you. Like, don't yell at me. But he's always, he gets it. And he's always like, come over a few. So I know he's coming over. And he comes over. We go through the whole show. Boom, 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 boom. Write it all out. That's about a half hour he leaves. Now we're about two hours before showtime. I like to just kind of take a little walk again. But here's my thing. When it gets about hour and 15 out, I like to... My boss would always have me. He's like, what are you doing? I get my rundown. It's called a rundown of show. Mm -hmm. And I print it out. And I have to color code it. It's like I'm Rain Man or something. Cool. Yeah, I color code my on cameras. I color code my VOs. So I know when I have that run of show there. And by the way, Aaron, I don't even really look at that thing during the show. But I don't know. But I need to mentally know that it's there. Because it's on my desk. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. That's awesome. Hour, hour left. In, hour left. Got to be an hour. I go in, I put on my suit, go into the makeup room, because we have a makeup room. Makeup gals are awesome. They're all my friends. They know I like to come in an hour. They know I like to come in an hour before. They know I like to sit down. I like to have TV on. I like to talk about our kids, what's going on in our lives. I always say to them, even though I've been with them eight years, not a lot. They always go, they're always like, we know. Like, I just, I just want a little, like, a little, little, little power. I don't like the whole thing. I feel weird. I feel fake. So, so it's just funny how I have to like even tell them, oh, just, just a little bit today. I, I think they all must laugh at me on the side. I wonder what they think. I, I, I should ask them. It's just my like, I don't know. It's what I need to do. You have a routine. And then when I'm, yeah. yeah, I have a routine. And when I'm done, I go back to my desk. And when there's like 45 minutes left, I'm not dicking around anymore. I'm not watching games. You know, I'll have the monitor on the whole time when I'm there. I'm watching other games. I'm kind of going through the show a couple more times. I like to go through it one more time. I like to read all the VO stuff because I didn't write those. So the voiceover stuff I want to read, on-camera stuff I write because I want to know it, questions I write. And then uh, with about 14 minutes left on the clock, I take my stuff. I go set it up in the conference room where we watch the game. My iPad my game notes, and I will fill out, I have a pad this big, and every game's a new sheet of paper, starting lineups, and just notes that I need for the post-game show. Because you can't script a post-game show, you don't know how the game's gonna end, right? So I go put that down, and then with 10 minutes on the clock, I walk into the studio and I get in my seat. Now, when that gets thrown off, and it has before, I'm a little weird. I gotta, okay. I gotta, you, know, I have, you have to, adjust, and that's the beautiful thing about sports. Right. You can have your routine, you can, Know that with 50 minutes on the clock, we're serving and passing. You can know that 30 minutes on the clock, the other team's there and you guys are going into your team room or whatever. It depends if you're high school, college. But sometimes that gets thrown off, bro. Sometimes you're taking a bus over and you're in traffic and you're not going to have much of a warm up. Sometimes I don't get to color code my thing. Sometimes I go in the makeup room and there's four people in line and I can't get in that chair. There's things that happen. There's monitor, there's, there's, um, things break in our studio where there is no all of a sudden we're on the fly like right. you have to prepare yourself be confident in what you're doing have a mindset whatever your routine is to get into you get into it and and if it gets thrown off the good ones have an ability to still deliver right and you do that amazingly and i want to i want to now talk about your self talk because I've been asking mm -hmm. guys that I've been uh, interviewing for this yep. process about self-talk during a match and even during yeah. the stoppage time. Because I, I believe mm -hmm. the stoppage time 
is huge, especially for the youth athlete. So just yeah. talk a little bit about your self-talk, what you're talking. I mean, we, I know we just talked about mindset, but self-talk is a little different because it's, it's actually what you're telling yourself. Yeah. I, I think for me, it's um, when it's, when it was AVP related um, and I knew I was going to be on doing intros, right? It was like getting loose, almost like you're running out under a tunnel. I would go bullet points in my head. Um, okay. Blah, 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 blah. Boom, boom, boom. I like this. Like, you know, like that's the self-talk for me is a lot of like, all right, let's go go time. You know, I'll walk in that studio, dude, 10 minutes left and I'm screaming at, I'm firing up at people. Sometimes, sometimes I just walk in and I'm mellow. It kind of depends on the mood I'm in, but my self-talk is pretty always much like, all right, let's do this. Go time. Who are we leading with? Who are we going with? I just like to, for me and everyone's different. I just like to run through things a little bit. It's like a quarterback where you're going through your first six plays, right? Like in my mind, my self-talk is more about like, what job do I got to do here? Who am I going to get in first? Who do I want to get off today? All right, let's go. Bang. And what about during commercials? You're on a live with. That's, that's a good question. Um, truthfully, there are times during commercials where I use them and I don't say a word because there's something coming that I got to be ready for. And it's not the norm or it's a bigger moment. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, it's when someone passes away is not fun. Dr. Bus, Kobe Bryant, there's days you cannot practice for in our job. There's no prompter. There's no script. Right. And you have to be so mentally in tune to what's going on. All of a sudden voiceovers, tweet, tweets are coming on the air and it's people's condolences and you cannot jack that up. You have to go slower. You have to enunciate better. You have to stay in control. Uh, those are not easy moments during commercials. You are emotionally spent and you have to, take a drink of water and you have to be quiet and you have to think for a second and you have to wait for your producer and you go, what do we got? And I write little notes to myself. That's always how I've been. Um, just like during games, I would always like as a coach, just write a little note because at the time out, I want to tell that kid something or after the game. I want, and, and I don't want to forget it because my mind works in a million different ways and I'll forget. So I boom, boom, boom. I jot it down. So sometimes the commercials, Aaron, man, big game. James is playing music. We're, not even we're dicking around we're not talking one second about anything and then the camera comes on and we're gold and there's other times where i'm really listening you know my job is to listen to the producer so my, my producers are genius because they they know me enough to they have a sense of the room when james is going or someone's going strong and i'm talking smack and i'm doing my thing they know they got an eye on the clock they know we have three minutes and when it gets down to 30 seconds gear i need you and when i hear that i know they need me so i gotta listen because they're not talking to these guys. Those guys don't know what's coming. Like I'm the one that has to know I'm the point guard. I'm driving it the ship. So no one's telling Shaq and Charles what's happening. Right. Ernie knows what's happening. Right. So it's the right, same thing right, for right. me. So, you know, commercials are, are, there's a, there's, there's a, it's dude, Aaron, it's just like playing, dude. There are some timeouts when it's 13, 13 and everyone's dead quiet. and They're looking at you. And there's times where you're up 20 to seven and you're chilling in that timeout, right? Like there's different timeouts, different commercials. Right. No, that's awesome. I, can you just build on that a little bit in terms of sports and, and put yourself, well, put yourself in, in the player mindset, stoppage time, especially volleyball, uh, not so much basketball. There's more flow in basketball, but like tennis, there's so much stoppage time, right? In between plays. You yeah. Know, what advice do you have for the athlete? How do you, you do, how do you use that time? Cause that t there's a lot of time, man. That time builds up. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a great point you make. And I think some people it's different, right? You know, I think there are players and I'm, I'm interested to see what Reed pretty would say, because I know me, I am a guy that kind of needed to communicate a little bit during down times and stoppage times. That's how I felt good. And it's just my personality and it was my way of, I don't know if it was being a point guard my whole life or a setter, or now if I play four mans and I'm playing that libero role, like it's just who I am and it helps me stay dialed in. And as a setter or point guard, you got to, I can see when someone's not right and, and maybe I'm communicating to them, but there are guys that I played with. They need to still do, yeah. dude, Aaron, don't say it. Just let that guy go. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And whatever that, whatever that weirdo is thinking in his head, you keep thinking it, man, just side out. What comes to my mind <laughs> right now when we talk, we're talking about this is Karch. 
you know, mm-hmm. in between plays when he was blocking, he used to go right up to that net and just, you know what I mean? And, and he was looking at the other side and how cerebral was Karch? How Karch is a computer, right, Aaron? So like, who God only knows what's going on in that guy's right. mind, right? Like, right. dude, he's a thinker. He's going, you know what? When that set's pushed a foot this way, that guy goes lying 87% of the time. So I'm going to chase. Like, that's the elite of the elite mind, man. Like, right. in-game thinking, dude. Like, I, my advice would be, like, obviously be yourself. If you're, in a, you know, if you're a leader, have the pulse of your team, all that stuff. But as a player, use that stoppage time to your advantage. Is it to gauge what's going on with that other team? And maybe they look tired or maybe they look defeated. Or maybe you've seen something that's working. Use that to your advantage to relay that to your team or relay it to yourself. Maybe you're a guy that needs to not touch anybody or talk during a game and you're chill. So my advice is always like, what really works for you? Use it to your advantage stoppage time. Stoppage time is valuable. Dude, use it to get a breath. Use it to relax and get back into a little Zen state, right? Absolutely. Whatever works. Yeah, since we talked about Karch, I mean, the the Karches and the Kobe's of the world, you know, let's talk about flow. Can you identify when you're in the game, in the flow, or in the zone? Yeah. Yeah, you can. You know, you know know that old saying, like, oh, my God, the basket looked so big. I could just throw it in from anywhere. The pitch... I was just in a zone and, and everything looked the game. I'd always say the game goes slower. Everything just happens and you see it. I, if you've ever had the, the, the beauty of now, listen, you and I can never say we had a zone like Karchi right. or MJ or Kobe, but we've had zones and it's the best feeling. I can remember times in my life that I've had them where for me, I feel like when you're really in that, perfect state in that flow you feel so happy inside and so confident that mistake doesn't bother you and you feel you can basically do anything and you also are in touch with what's good i'm putting it in volleyball terms as a setter you know exactly what you're doing in terms of who you're setting and why and it's an amazing feeling i know they're going here and i'm flowing it there I know I got one up here and I'm setting the middle bomb. It's just a, it's just a flow that's like hard to explain, but you feel you're, you're, you're confident. It feels so damn good. The game moves slower and you're in tune with everything going on in that game. Am I right? Or am I, have you had that? It, it's a crazy feeling. Like be, you played a lot of beach in your day. There's days where you sighted out for hours. You just sighted out. You saw everything, right? And even when you made that one little mistake and you hit out, it didn't even bother you because you were coming right back and siding out again. Can you practice that or does it just kind of happen? Did you ask Reed that question? Yeah. What did he say? I'm I'm, I'm curious because Reed, what that guy did indoor is freaking crazy, dude. I know. I know. For, for, For years. And then how about ending on the note he ended on like coming in in bronze game and just, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, man. Like, he, I'm pretty sure he said no, but you just bank on yeah. operation. Yeah. I, the reason why I ask is because, like, I feel like Reed took his craft. Karch takes his craft. Kobe took his craft very, very serious. And they practiced good habits. So when you are in that state and in that flow and in that zone, you feel like you've been there a million times. Right, right. It's hard to practice it because as you and I know, you can feel great in a practice and you can be in the zone in a practice, but boy, when it's in a game, it's a different feeling. <laughs> just, totally. No, absolutely. But I guess what I'm trying to get at is, you know, there are moments in training, for example, that I remember that I had a great rep and I remember that rep and I, and I try to bank the feeling of that rep. Yes. To put me in the game, you know, and I would like to... I would like to ask you, are there tools that, that youth athletes can use in training to help bank the feeling of being in the flow? Oh, that's good. That's good. There's something about repetition that – there's something about repping something. Like say you're, I'm, you know, you're teaching a kid on the left side that like cross body down the line. You know what I mean? And you just – 
all of a sudden one day it feels right. Right. It, I'm right. doing it with my daughter now. Like in, in like, there's just that day where all of a sudden the practice, the practice, the repetition becomes, Oh my God, it's habit. I can do it every time. It's not six out of 10. It's 10 out of 10 where I can feel it. You got to, and it's, how do you bank that? Right? Like, well, am I right? You know what I'm thinking of right now yeah. is there's a video of Steph Curry on YouTube. Yeah. Hitting like 53s in a row. Yeah. I watched it. It's incredible. I mean, he, he's just. And dude, my boy Q dog is rebounding for him. I think Bruce Frazier, who's like a great dude. Oakley Q. Yeah. yeah dude, it's kind of amazing. I think it might, be, it might even be more than 50, but like, that like what you're saying that repetition and i'm wondering like is he, is that all mechanics is there a part of you know I, I i well aaron i honestly think and it's a combination of it all right it's right. it's it, it's talent right it's work it's it's the technique of it all yeah like you said it's it's the stroke um there's just beauty in it but but all of that there still comes a mental side of it that has to be in tune as well. When Steph Curry's flowing, it's, it'd be amazing to know what that guy's like. He just goes, I know, right. And I don't know. It's a, it's this like 100% belief in yourself that mm. this I'm making it, I'm doing it and nothing's stopping me. And I think it goes hand in hand with all those things you talked about, the physical parts of it, but also there's a mental component that has to be there. Because you have to be dialed in and same thing with being in that flow state, right? That zone. There's a mental component of that. Huge. Like there's a feeling, there's a mindset, there's a confidence, there's a belief, all that stuff where you're not thinking about next Tuesday and where you're going to tacos, right? Like, <laughs> right. but by the way, when you're not having an inspirational practice or you're not in a flow state, how much does your mind wander? Dude, when you're hitting 80 in a row, your mind's not wandering. So it's when everything is on the same page, everything's on the same path. And so, so build on that because again, this project is all about tools for that moment. Yeah. So, you know, what kind of tools do you think you could offer or think about to have the athlete get back in the zone or the flow when they're not like you mentioned that focus, you know, like your focus is amazing, man. Like you've always been focused, even when you're doing ADP finals and yeah. Like you're so dialed, but like, were there moments where you dipped out of that? Yes. How'd you get back in? Yes. How do you get back in? It's a good one. Same thing with sports, right? How do you get back in? Yeah. How do you get back in? I, it seems like everyone does so many different things. Furby used to have this, Matt Furbringer would do this meditation thing where you tried to you know, look down at the ground and, you know, I think everyone's got their thing. I'm trying to think for me <clears throat> as a player, as an announcer, cause I've always kind of put them hand in hand and they mm -hmm. go together. Um, I've always thought what works for me is when I get knocked out of that state or knocked off that horse, there has to be a moment I, personally, Aaron. So I'm not saying this works for everybody, but I always have to have a moment whether it, it's not necessarily a timeout, but you need to have a moment of just you thinking for a second. Mm. For some people, it's a deep breath. For some people, it's a snap out of it, dude. There's some people just, let's go. For some people, it's a key word. It's a right now I'm siding out right now. I'm doing this. Like I could feel myself drifting in the job and there's a way that I've been able to, I sense it and I just take a moment and I, for me, I just get quiet for a second and I think about how do I get back on track? I come out in this next segment and I'm myself and I crush it and then we're moving on. How do I get out of this? Well, I'm going to come out and I'm going to make a play. I'm going to dig a ball. I'm going to set a ball. You know what? We're going to score. I'm going to fire up and I'm going to, and, and we're off and running again. Like you just have to be able to pull yourself back in and, but that comes from awareness of knowing you're not there. Mm. You have to be self aware and you have to be honest with yourself and you better be able to feel when you don't have it. You have to, dude, you got to feel it. I love that. You know, someone asked me one time, what's the main thing I teach at West coast uh, volleyball club. And without hesitation, I said, I teach gratitude. 
Mm, and and to me, like that's the number one tool that I use if I'm yeah. ever. I'm like, okay. man, I'm so grateful. Look, I get to do what I I love. Yeah, you know, that's good. I, does that help you too? Yeah, that's 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 actually a really good one. Um, I it, I don't think we have enough of that. I think it's mm-hmm. actually a special one. I love that. That's what you say. That's a that's an awesome answer. You know, another thing for kids, dude, for tools, a really good one, especially for younger man, is. Um, when things aren't going well, it's usually as well a technical, like think it's hard for kids to like, Oh my God, I'm hitting the ball out. I'm like, you know what? Your left foot's not around. Your left shoulder's not leading and you're dropping your arm every time. And you're you're a young, yeah. Like you're a young, you're a young volleyball player still. I know you've been playing for three years, but that doesn't mean you, you're not going to technically make mistakes. And like for a kid to like be able to go, Oh my God, I like, let me take a little something off it. Let me think about my steps again. Let me think about getting my arm back. Let me think about reaching. Uh, okay, I'm back. Why am I serving that ball out? Well, you're dropping your arm when you serve. You know, think about contacting high. Take a moment. Relax. Get back into the technical things. So it depends on what level you're at, right? Like, does, you're not yeah. talking to Karch about his technical things, but hey, Karchi, you know, think about, you know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you for know, sure. even, uh, even at a high level, it's like, hey, you're doing this, you're doing that. And it could just be one little thing, one yeah. little thing to get your right. mind, your mind right. I love it. Let's move on. Let's talk about sources, man. Where do you get inspiration from? And I know you dropped some names already and, you know, but just build on that. Where do you get inspiration from? From whom? How? You know, I like watch. I, you said something earlier that was really cool. Uh, I've, I've been fortunate enough a lot in my life to uh, um, see greatness, recognize it, yeah. be around it. And that's always inspired me. I've, I've always been inspired by people who do extraordinary things. Uh, I'm always inspired by people who have Mm -hmm. a phenomenal story that weren't given things on a silver platter that were able to to overcome odds. I really identify with those people. And I don't know why, because I've been real fortunate. Uh, I've always been in a good position. My parents did a good job of putting me in good schools and I always had good coaches. And I mean, I've been real fortunate, Uh, but I would love the people who, get there without it, um, yeah. who, who make their own path. And I, I don't know, I just, that, that, that stuff inspires me in terms of, you know, the pro athletes, I think, you know, obviously the Kobe's of the world, the MJ's, you know, I loved magic as a kid. I love the people that do it kind of, I don't know, man, like I love, the, I love guys who, who win at the gnarliest level and, and women under the craziest pressure to be able to stay on top is the hardest thing because when you win there's a little dip you're going to celebrate you're going to know how to do it and you go "Ah, i don't need to push it this much because i know i can ramp it back up the all-time greats continue to go here it's in and they'll call it a curse as well because they're never satisfied Um, they don't have that gratitude all the time that you talk about and I, i think that's the beauty of is having a little bit of balance it's okay to have some gratitude take some time off and have some balance because you're going to be better for it in the end, right? It's a miserable life sometimes when all you want to do is win, win, win at no costs. And how do I get there? And how am I the greatest? All of a sudden you're leaving, you're forgetting about the other beautiful things in life. Uh, and then you're scrounging later in life to try to scramble and try to find it. Right. So having that, the ones that are able to maintain this drive, uh, uh, maintain this, um, awesome ability to go after the goal and then you don't always win. Right. But like you're right back at it. Mm -hmm. And then when they're there, you know what winning means to them because you see it, the emotion that goes into it. Tiger finally winning the masters after what, 10 years was insane. And like, dude, if you would have told, they would have told me and you in 09 tigers never winning again for 10 years, you would have been like, dude, you're out. There's no chance. Right. Like there I'm, I'm, I, that stuff inspires me. Like, I love those stories and inspired performances. Don't you do, do, do get, get knocked down and rise back up. What's better in the world than getting knocked down and finding a way back to the top. And all of a sudden you're the one at the top. Oh my God, dude. I don't know why. I love it, dude. I love it in movies. I love it in books. I love it in sports. I love it in life. I love it. I love it. It's my thing. Uh, uh, Me too, man. I love it. Yeah. Great answer. Um, we're going to move to the popcorn questions. These are a little bit shorter. Again, let's do it. Answer them how you want. How do you define success and what does being successful mean to you? 
I think I would answer this differently a long time ago. I, I, I think success is knowing you put a lot into something and you gave it everything you had. And I think it sounds so cliche, but like just knowing that you had a goal and you put in the work to get to that goal. Um, I feel like success is being a part of a journey, whether it's by yourself or with a team or a family and that journey being filled with all kinds of moments. But in the end, there's this moment of, uh, I don't know, gratitude. It's a word you use, you know, like if you can be a part of something bigger than you, that's successful. If you can inspire people, that's successful. Uh, there's that famous quote, if you can make one person breathe easier, you've been successful. If you can add some value to someone's life, and be a, a instrument for them, whether it's role model, whether it's a shoulder to lean on, whether it's being there for them during the dark time. Uh, that's success for me. It's not about dollars, man. It, it, it really, I, I know we think it's about dollars and medals and wins and losses. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way deeper than that, actually. That's way awesome. deeper. How do you consider the idea of failure? How do I, how do I look at failure? Yeah, how do you consider the idea of failure? Mm. You know, nobody wants to. Uh, you know, it makes it doesn't feel good. Uh, it can, it can hurt. It can hurt you mentally. It can hurt you physically. But it's also a part of everything. So for me, at least I hope that I'm able to impart on my own kids and the kids that I coach that through failures. You learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about the people you trust and the people you consider your people in your family and who's in your circle. Um, because through failures, the ones that are with you through those are the ones that are going to, the ones that deserve to be there when you're out of it. Um, failures are part of it, man. If, if we didn't fail, I life wouldn't be as fun, bro. I, I hate it. I like that. It sucks. Uh, but it makes everything else so good. If everything was good all the time, we wouldn't be able to decipher right. between wins and losses, right, man? Like, right. I, I, you from, know, what comes up for me is contrast. The idea of contrast. It's not like good or bad. It's kind of like the yin yang symbol. It's just yeah, 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 yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. Failure's real, man. It's, yeah. And there's failure on a lot of levels. Some that's out of our control. Right. You know, I think failure when it was in your control, and maybe you misstepped or you did something wrong uh it's hard it, it yeah. can beat you down it really can man it can have you in the lowest of the lows but that can also help you redefine some things right and some it of the really most can. successful people i talk to including yourself always welcome failure like i talked to todd rogers and he was like yeah you know you, you use failures to learn period yep you know? and yep. And, I, and i love that so that that leads me to my next thing which is what are the most successful habits that you do on a consistent basis Control what you control. Control what you can. You you can can you can control how you treat your body, how you treat your mind. You can control what you want to read. Um, you can control what you want to learn. I think those those are the things that are essential. Those are the things uh, that you you know. There's a lot of things in your life that you're going to be made. Yeah, we got to do this. You got to do that. You got to pay this bill. You got to pay that bill. But for me, like creating habits <clears throat> that are good for your soul and good for your growth are the important parts of things. You know, like um, whether it's uh, your habit of uh, you know saying I love you before you go to bed or giving your loved one a kiss before you go, but whatever habits you have, whatever traditions you have, those are, those are really important to me. They always have been. Um, it's funny when I, when I officiate a wedding, I've been asked to officiate a lot of weddings. I have like 19 or 20 under my belt. It's amazing. But one of my th things at the end is always like, remember the traditions you have as a couple. And when you add to your family, don't forget those traditions for you two, right? Like it's really important in life to create, habits for yourself that that are good ones <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean how do you want to be treated how do you want to treat people there are things you learn when you're five years old man but it's even way more important when you're older right right right, right. that's awesome 
What's the most important lesson that has helped shape who you are today? Hmm. Like something I went through or more of uh, like something I, like a mantra. Either one up to you. One thing I, a, a big one lately that I've thought about because when I talk to college kids or high school kids broadcasting, usually yeah, um, I'm always trying to deliver a message and there's a big one that I've really thought has become important later in my life. And that's to be me because I was told uh, by someone to, Hey man, when you're on air, be yourself. Like that's your biggest strength. And yeah. I feel so many times we think we have to be someone else. And it really hit me that I can't be that stiff guy in my job and try to be so buttoned up. Like there's a million of those dudes <laughs> and it's not, I'm not very good at that. There are guys way better than that. What I'm, well, who I am in my personality, I, I have to, I have to flow. I have to be myself. I have to not be afraid to make fun of myself. I have to not be afraid to say a joke, to see what that line is and almost cross it, but don't and test the boundaries and take risks. That's me. Mm. And, and I have to do it. And if you're true to yourself and you're you, I feel like you can be successful in in your profession, whatever that is, like just, just, it's tough to be someone else, man. It's tough, dude. It's tough to try to change your personality to fit other people. It's really hard, mm. man. It's really hard. So I think I've, I've, I've tried to express that to kids. My, my, my big one that I always write on the board is, is when preparation meets opportunity. That's my favorite thing in the world. And it's from day one, it's what I believed. It's what I tell every student, every kid I will coach or I will talk to about broadcasting. Whatever you do in life, prepare for that moment because an opportunity is going to come. It came for me. Yeah. I've had many of them along the way. And dude, you better be ready. Yeah. And you go for it. Win or lose. Be ready because someone is going to believe in you and someone's going to give you a chance. And when you get called up and you're not ready and you know, you didn't prepare, then your mind is going to F with you, dude. And it's going to play tricks on you and you're not ready and you're not your best. But when you feel good, because I studied my ass off of that test, think about the test, dude. I remember those tests I went into right in study. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. But when you studied, you're like, let's go. Right. Right. Let's go. Right. Preparation meets opportunity. Take your swing dog. I love it. Can you share the biggest challenge you've been through on your journey? You know, yeah, you know, I think for me, uh, we always want to, I want to do that. I want that. I want to make that money. I want to wait. I want that guy's job learning in my life and in my profession that my road and my journey and the timing of it is what it is. And to not always look at what else is out there and is the grass greener. The biggest challenge for me has been staying in the moment and being appreciative. As you mentioned, gratitude again, it's such a good one. I've been, I've been terrible at that at times. Like, dude, you have it good right here. Like mm -hmm. be in that moment, make this stop asking, like, can I get that one? Can I get that gig? As I was coming up, it was always like, I want that. I want that. How do I be that guy? And learning to like, Hey man, good for that person. I'm worried about what I'm doing. You know, it's been, it's, it's been challenging for sure. Like in this business, you want to move up so quickly, Aaron, you want to be, you want to do this. You want to do that. I want to be the guy and it takes time. And, right. and if you try to be that guy before you're ready, you ain't never going to be that guy. Right. So right. enjoy where you're at. Be patient with it. Um, patience has always been a challenge for me. You know, I haven't had like crazy gnarly obstacles where I've been fired and sent down, knock on wood, but like I've, I, you know, the tour went under, I'm bankrupt. I lost that job. I've, I've been over, I've been, people have been picked uh, for a job over me, you know, when I thought I could have been that guy and, you know, there's challenges along the way, but more, it's more for me, it's not like a certain thing that challenged me, like an event in my life. You know, we've all had events where people pass away and we've all gone through stuff that have set you back or changed your path. But for me, it's always been an inner challenge. The challenge is coming from me. It's, 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 it's me trying to t learn, hey, man, 
what are the goals? What are the priorities? Okay, refocus on that. Be happy where you're at, you know, kind of thing. Absolutely. Me too. That's why I'm making this yeah, um, that's why hard I'm project, man, because I, I want to pay it forward to the next generation. That for it's, sure, for sure. It's, it's an inside journey. The tools, are yep. the tools are not no out. Doubt. The tools are within. No you know? doubt. Um, just a few more, bro. Um, how important is the idea of impact to you? How important is it? It's huge. It's everything. And you know, it's impact that events and people have on you, you know, the impact of Kobe passing away and what that meant to a city, what that meant to my job, um, the impact you have on people, um, the impact you have on your kids, uh, kids that you coach, um, impact is everything because you can, you could have a great impact and a meaningful one and you can have a, and there's another way it can go. Right. Be a positive impact, man. Positive impact can save people's lives. Literally, literally impacts important, man. This is perhaps the most important question I think I could ask anybody, but specifically you, because I look up to you a lot. I appreciate you, brother. What is your ultimate why? Hmm. What is my ultimate why? Dig into that one a little deeper. Like what? Like why? What, what you, yeah, uh, it, it, I know. It's, 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 why do you do what you do, man? Yeah. You know? what, why are you the person that you are? You know? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I was going a different. Okay, good. Okay. Go, yeah. I mean, take it whatever direction you no, want. No, 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 no. Now that's, that's way more impactful. I like that. <laughs> so, oh, that's good, man. Like straight shooter. When I was younger, I think the ultimate why was this feels good. I feel like I'm doing this because it's what I'm supposed to do. And man, this let's go. Can I make money? Can I be great at something? It was my, that was my, I got to be honest, like <clears throat> in my 20s, that's what I thought about. Like, oh my God, let's go. I want to do this. Wanna, but my why has changed a hundred percent. My why has become, and this is no joke, it's become to be a part of something. I love being a part of something awesome. I love being a part of like a winning team. I don't need to be at the star. I just always want to be a part of something that's good and great that people love. It makes me feel so good and I love it. And it's what drives me and it's what motivates me. And it's what inspires me and it's what impacts me. That's the why in my profession. That's why I do it. But to go another layer on that, for me, it's, dude, there's this thing that, and it's not the 1950s mentality, but there's this thing in me that's, I want to provide for my family. It's a big thing for me. Like, and I know everyone wants to provide, but I want to create this life that's that they look back on and they say, man, this was awesome. Like my mom and dad made this, we were here, we were there, we did this during quarantine. We did this. Like, right. I think, you know, like I, I have to every time in my life where maybe I've gotten frustrated or angry or wanted to say something to a boss, dude, my biggest tool, I look at a picture of my family and go, bro, chill know where you're at, know what's important. Why are you here? You're here because this is what you do to make that great, to make your family the best it can be. That's the why for me. Like I want to do it. So one day I can retire and have grandkids and we can talk about glory days and my fam, my girls can be, you know, they can look at a foundation that they had growing up. That was, that was beautiful. Yeah. That's what I want. That's what I want. And that's my why. Yeah. It might sound, sound like, I don't know. Maybe that's cheesy, man, but no, no, no. I, it's, 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 it's the reason I can't like the reason used to be more selfish. You know, I want right. this, I want that. I'm why, because I want to be great. I want, and then it just changed. It shifted, shifted as I got older. It's now more about, <clears throat> you know, you know, I think my background from sports, like Northridge changed me. Like your why when you're younger is 
I want to be the best. I want this. That's why I'm here. And when I went to Northridge, I wasn't that guy anymore. Mm. I was on a great team playing a sport I was just learning that I didn't grow up playing. And I had a guy named Matt Unger who became my best friend, really. And he, he was better. And he taught me a ton. And we battled in practice. And he started and I rode the bench. And I became a part of something great. And it felt so good. And I remember telling someone on a podcast years ago that my top five wins in my career, I don't even think I stepped on the floor in two of them, <laughs> three of them. And that's what Team Fletch was about in the sixth man for me, like 25 guys, whether you play or not, being a part of something great. Right. And that's what I love about what I'm doing now. Like I want to be a part of a broadcast that people want to watch because it's fun and it makes you feel good. Yeah. And it's not about me being great. I want to be a part of it. So it's shifted. I think when I was younger, it was about me. I want to be great. Shifted. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I don't know when it shifted, but that is my honest answer. Like, it's I, now I, more about like, dude, I got to provide for these guys until, until I can't provide, like until it's over, right? Like, <laughs> I'm going to go, go, go. I love it. I, I know it's a deep question, you know, and do, do you think that more youth athletes and just young people in general should really look at that question? Yeah, man. It's, it's, I, I'm so glad you asked it because I got to be honest, it's, it's something I should start looking at too. And I should, you know, and, and, and by the way, it's okay. I, I think it's okay to be selfish about it. The why can be, it's about you. Right. Why are you doing it? What's your why? And how that can change or how, you know, I just feel like when we can learn that it's okay to have a selfish component because that's what drives you and that's what you know, wants you to get better because you want to be great, but also realizing that there's another component to it that's just as important. And that's <clears throat> being a part of something that's way bigger than just one person, right? A team, a corporate, you know, a, 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 whatever it's a team in the workplace or a family, everything's a unit, right? Everything's a team. So, you know, for me, like the why teaching kid, you know, hopefully a why can for younger generation, they can start to learn, man, it's not just about you. The why is the why is bigger than you, right? Right. You know. Yeah, and it's. I think it's also okay to not know if you're. Dude, totally. You know. Totally. Totally. And, and and you know this is you know getting to the end here. Like the reason why I'm doing this project, man, is you know being a product of UCLA. I saw the pyramid of success at the yep. you know, outside the gym every day. Get yep. in your head. Yep. You know, and I've experienced winning, and winning yep. is awesome. But to me, winning is great. Right. And it is, and it never gets old, but it never gets old to me. There's, there's, there's something else. Yeah. And, and to me, that's what inspired living is. And that's, and that's what yeah. I'm, I'm really trying to, uh, to suggest, you know, yeah. but that, that, that works for me. And, and I guess my question to you now is, you know, I made this pyramid, which, which works for me. Would you suggest everyone make their own pyramid that works for them? Yeah, I kind of like that idea. I, I, I looked at yours and uh, I think it's awesome. And I think like that should be your thing that you publish and you give to people and you give to your kids. And, but yeah, I think like you can say like, hey, this is the pyramid that I, I've talked to a hundred people. This right. is what works for me. This is what I've gathered from talking to all these people. So I know these tools work and I know this is what it's about but you might have something different. Make right. your own. That's right. Make your own. Yeah, you can make your compass, You can right? use six of mine or you can use one or you can right. use them all, but make your own. Right. And, and, and see where they value. You know what I mean? I think it's cool to see what they value. What's at the top? What's the foundation that you build from? Yeah. Cool, man. You know, the whole thing about a pyramid, right, is you build on each block. Right. Right. So it's interesting to see where those things fall. Exactly. What goes hand in hand. And, and it's interesting to see, like you said, everyone's specific perspective, you know, everyone's yep. coming at it from a different way. But yep. I think something specific that Reed said is you have to know where you're going. No doubt. You have to know, like, like you know, yeah. you know what I mean? And if you don't, yeah. you just float, you know? Yep. So, Dude, I can't wait, man. Listen, hey, I'm real proud of you. I'm so stoked you're doing this. Thank you, man. I, I, I appreciated you having me and uh, I can't believe it's four 30. I got to hop on a conference call. Actually, I, know, work. I know. I know. Hey, dude, that was unbelievable. That, 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 that flew. Yeah. Well, Hey, you crushed it, man. I, I can't dude. thank you enough. Geeter, Chris McGee. You're, you're, hey, awesome. you're my guy, dude. You're inspiring. Much love. Peace and blessings. Hey man, listen, listen, what you're doing is inspiring. It's so cool. And uh, for me, that's what it's about too. Is like, you want 
to impart this on other kids, that's called impact. Like you're, that's cool, man. Do what, do you, I love it, bro. Thank you, brother. All right. You're the man, man. Okay. Later, man. man. Okay, brother. All right. Bye.